uh, I'm going to begin, and we're going to get back into Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. I just wanted to draw your attention before we commence with a work I believe I mentioned, but I didn't give the full uh, citation here. Isabel Rivers' Classical and Christian Ideas in English Renaissance Poetry, A Student Guide. There you go. So it's in a link, in a hyperlink there. And I highly recommend this work. I came across it after I finished my uh, graduate studies and then realized that this work actually existed and I could have been using it all along because it was first published in 1979. Very good if you look at the table of contents. It covers everything uh, from the idea of the Golden Age and the Garden of Eden and the connections therein uh, to how the pagan gods are used in the poetry of the period, to uh, the use of philosophy, Platonism and Neoplatonism, and then Stoicism, and then the varying views of history, etc. Very interesting. Cosmology, interesting. Reformation, the Counter Reformation. So these are issues in the poetry of the day. In terms of views of history, it, it's quite fascinating uh, to see that there are different understandings of history that Shakespeare uh, is appealing to. Because in modern historiography, we think of history uh, uh, in terms of progress. That, uh, since the Enlightenment 18th century, we historicize everything. We think of humanity on a continuum of time and uh, of progressive development. And that fits in with the evolutionary model that we also use in biology and so forth. But in Shakespeare's period, that's not how history was viewed. Uh, there, were, there wasn't one view per se, but there were different views of how to understand humanity in the context of time. And progress was certainly not one of them. <laughs> Other than in the Christian theological sense, where it becomes eschatological, where everything is uh, moving towards the eschaton, uh, the second coming of Christ, and in that sense, it's moving forward because that's a better time. So in that sense, it's uh, progressive. But it's not progressive in the sense that life just keeps on getting better and better and better, which is the bias of uh, our age and has been for a few hundred years, um, despite the evidence to the contrary. And the main proof for uh, modern historiography sense of progressive uh, development is, is technology. Um, but whether that's a good or an ill is, is questionable. And as I say, uh, the 20th century had world wars on such a massive scale with such horrific casualties that it certainly questions the claims that things are getting better and better, and not just things, but people. And that, I think, is the key point uh, on this course is, it, is it the case that human nature can keep getting better and better? And what would be the, the measure of that then? Uh, it's certainly not the, one, the advantage that Shakespeare takes in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, there we meet the four couples, just to refresh your memories from last week, uh, Theseus and Hippolyta representing the, uh, the kings and the queens or the aristocracy. Uh, and then three sets of lovers, um, the, 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 the two pairs that are the, uh, the main substance of the story, uh, Hermia and Lysander on the one hand, and Helena and Demetrius on the other, with their two intertwining plots, um, who have their corollary in terms of a, a people group, if you will, in the commoners, who are standing in front of sta Shakespeare on the floor, um, who themselves are putting on a comedy about love. And the, the comedy is that of Pyramus and Thisbe, and it's a farce. Not that they intend it to be a farce. They think it's very realistic. They're worried it's so realistic that people might <laughs> be led to do the wrong things because it's, um, they're such good actors. So there's an element of comedy even in this. But uh, Shakespeare's not seeking to humiliate them. He's not looking down upon them. He's, uh, he's laughing with them as much as anything. We'll find that sort of condescension is also mirrored in how Theseus and Hippolyta will receive the play when it is finally put before them, because it is, of course, ridiculous. But they're not, um, again, so there's uh, uh, this idea of hierarchy there is intrinsic in Shakespeare's worldview. 
but there's a dignity within each group and there's also a, a sense of there's something ludicrous in this particular group as well, including amongst the uh, aristocracy. Uh, it's just a different sort of ludicrousness. But Shakespeare is aware of the, f of the uh, fallibility of each of the groups, and they are presented together. But that idea of the hierarchy uh, is retained in British culture to this day, for good or for ill. Um, in the, uh, but in this period, in the idea of the Elizabethan great house. So think Downton Abbey, or think Jane Austen, or think uh, any of the um, British uh, comedies, or often uh, think Jane Austen. Um, you have the idea of the upstairs where the aristocracy live, and the downstairs where the servants work and labor. And you, it's something like um, mirrored this, but there's an idea in the Elizabethan gr Great House story, which I looked at in 17th century literature, that there is a sort of human perfection, a microcosm of pu human perfection in the Grand House. So the aristocrats are upstairs looking after the cares and concerns of the common people who serve them gladly with joy, with delight, and to some degree I think Downton Abbey actually reflects that. So there is tension, there are problems, but there's also genuine respect that goes both ways. And the result of that is that everything flourishes. And it's a microcosm of the Garden of Eden uh, here. So that, again, is Shakespeare's um, template when he presents all of his works, but particularly the comedies. At the end of it, there's a marriage scene. Just like in Austin, there's often a marriage uh, between um, uh, her heroines and her heroes, uh, it represents the, hu the perfect human pair, Adam and Eve, who, are the f who uh, have the very first wedding. And the fruitfulness of their union will be blessing that spreads outward and the Garden of Eden is expanded, etc. But that's what Shakespeare has in mind here. <coughs> oh, I forgot the fourth level, uh, the fairies. And they are interesting. Uh, and, and deserve more attention. I'm going to give them a little bit more attention uh, today because they, of course, um, are on, on, in one sense, they're just another group of characters. In another sense, obviously, they are um, above and outside them. They work in the realm of fairy. They have power over uh, men and over nature. And uh, to some degree, they represent um, the work of the imagination themselves. Remember I talked about two views of the imagination. One, that it was a faculty that could lead to madness and chaos <clears throat> and disorder because, of course, the passions are ruling over the reason and often are, and are anarchic, if not totally disruptive, chaotic, um, when the passions are ruling with that sort of imagination. People are lunatics under the influence of the moon. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, they seem to be something like a surrogate for the playwright himself. When I say a surrogate, a, um, a stand-in. They represent what, what the good use of imagination can do. But no, we use the same word, imagination. And it blurs from one to the other, and Puck brings about the bad use of the imagination that uh, results in chaos and disorder. <clears throat> Whereas Oberon and Titania, as the king and queen of the fairies, are trying to order things rightly in a rational way so that order and blessing and uh, harmony ensues. And so I, again, I'd say, I think this is a very uh, nuanced and interesting way of looking at the imagination because post-enlightenment, the romantics take the lead on what the imagination as a faculty does, and it's only good in the Romantics' uh, view. And we tend to see it the same way. We think the imagination is the means to all social betterment. If people were just a little bit more imaginative, they would understand what it's like to be another person, and if they just had this empathy, they would know that um, they need to be more inclusive and see things from other people's point of view. And then, so the imagination would rectify all human ills, which are simply that of limited perspective. So just need a broader perspective. 
Imagination will solve all that problem. Shakespeare never thinks anything like that. He does think the imagination is a, basically a magical faculty who, who can do exactly what the playwright does, which is to present the stage as a microcosm of the world, and he can fix uh, all problems through his dramaturgy, through orchestrating what will happen. And we see in this story, one of the humorous things is that Oberon and Titania keep messing up, in part because their servant, Puck, is uh, a mischief maker. And so there's discord in, uh, in his work while he's trying to, uh, to serve the purposes of harmony. So discord and concord as competing themes. But the whole play is revolving around a marriage, right? So it begins with a marriage, the Annunciation, that in four days' time there will be a marriage between Theseus and Hippolyta. And we talked about the nature of that union last time. Uh, it's not the way you usually woo your wife. You want to live? Marry me. Like some of us might have to go to that extreme to get a woman to marry us, I don't know, but it's not the usual way one woos um, with threats of death. Um, this is a violent, it's a passionate, to some degree, it's, the use of, it's not an appeal to reason at all. He's saying, come, be reasonable, dear, and I'll remove my sword from your throat. She says, I see what you're saying, okay. But she has not yet uh, um, been won over in any way. And he wants to win her over, does Theseus. And uh, so there's a conflict here presented in Act 1, Scene 1, between Eros on, the other, on one hand and the social order and the chaos that ensues. And it's represented by Athens, which allegedly represents reason, the Greek city that's famous for the philosophers and the uh, ancient uh, comedy, among other things. Um, and yet, it's so disordered that a father is willing to kill his daughter simply because she doesn't love the man he wants her to love. And he wants her to love that man because he says so, basically. And there's no other reason, no better reason. So it's, an, it's not a rational choice. It's just willful on his part. You will do what I say. Or else, and the or else is... Now, now, Theseus, not, Theseus is a little bit more, um, he offers an alternative. You don't have to die, but you will have to go into exile and live into, uh, you, you'll have to go into a nunnery and you'll have to live a life of, of permanent um, uh, chastity and you will be cut off from the world. Now, it's a better outcome but it's going to not fulfill the desire of, of love that the whole, whole play is about. Because she's not going into, the, into um, the nun's orders because she, out of devotion for Christ. It's not because of that love. It's simply to avoid dying. So again, the wrong motivation. So these motivations are not based on love, they're based on force, coercion, violence, etc. very bad motivations. Uh, so I think our, scene, our, our sympathies, and this is interesting because I said that Shakespeare's hierarchical worldview would entail that he thinks that the fathers do have some measure of rule over their, ch over their daughters. You know, parents obey your children. There's, there's supposed to be obedience there. Uh, but he is clearly putting our sympathies with the daughter. The father's being overbearing and totally unreasonable, just like Theseus is overbearing and wooing his wife. That's not how you do things, you know, through force, you know, marry me or, or die. And uh, it's not how a father gets his, fa his daughter to do what he wants either, marry him or die. It, so there's a parallel there to some degree and a disorder, even in the midst of order. So there's a, there's a superficial order that holds this hierarchy in place, and yet the hierarchy itself is disordered because it does not obey love. And so how are we going to rectify misplaced senses of love 
is through right understandings of love, and that comes through the use of the imagination and the use of the playwright. And so Shakespeare, when he says this, is saying something about how art can function as an educational uh, form, but in education, not in the sense of tedium, but in the sense of drawing the affection so that we, our souls are rightly ordered, so that we want the good, that we love the good, that we love the just, etc. Not that we just recognize it, but really want it to be so. So as I say, Act uh, 1, Scene 2 introduces the commoners and the ridiculous play of Pyramus and Thisbe, um, who eventually commit suicide. It's not a good choice for, for a play, particularly given the fact that we know that uh, Hermia and Lysander are going out into the woods right now. And so there's a little bit of threat, and this is n not uncommon in Shakespeare's comedies. Uh, potential tragedy on the horizon, and sometimes real tragedy. People do die in the comedies. Um, and then there's that play, I'm not going to deal with this, but Romeo and Juliet, which looks like it's going to be a comedy, and then uh, and in fact, there might even be a resolution to it and ends uh, bitterly in a terrible tragedy, which is why it's called a tragedy. Uh, but anyway, Act 2, Act 2, Scene 1, introduces the fairies for the first time. And these fairies are figures of fantasy. I'm just going to have to keep pushing this up in a ridiculous way. Um, and introduces us to the idea of the supernatural. Now, as I said, Everything is hierarchical, but hierarchical includes the realm of God, who's above space and above time. He's above the height of height, as it says in Milton's Paradise Lost, whatever that means. But what it certainly means is that we need the notion of height to understand how much greater God is than we are. And yet height is a misnomer because God is not confined to space and time. So then, as I say, hence Milton says that above the height of height, there lies God. Same with the supernatural, and the same to some degree, the powers of Oberon and Titania. They're above nature. Note that they're not within nature. It's not romanticism. It's not that everything, every being, the commoners, the aristocrats, the lovers has God in them. Everything's not filled with God. God's above these things and is able to influence them precisely because he's above this. But Oberon and Titania do have the equivalent of what we call superpowers. Um, God-like powers. They can even control thoughts. But they are not infallible. And they're not omniscient. So they have a, a super, uh, superhuman ability to uh, control things, to influence things, just like the planets do in Shakespeare's cosmology. They influence, they move, they, just like the moon. The moon moves the, the ocean up and down. The tides are influenced by the, by the proximity of the moon and the, or its various cycles, but they're not, they can't see into the future. They're trying to push things and motivate them, and to some degree, their, their powers are a lot like, as I say, the dramaturge's powers, Shakespeare's powers. So that, this is one of the interesting things, and it, you're going to see it repeatedly on this course. Shakespeare pl puts uh, dramaturge figures in his plays, representing what art does, rightly from a Renaissance perspective. And I happen to think it's, it's a good perspective, it's even a Christian perspective that um, art rightly used, rightly understood, rightly uh, enacted, has a power which the Romantics give it credit to have, which is to rectify wrongs, and then to want to live accordingly. So here's the template, here's the ideal, and you do, you do likewise. Imitate what you see on stage here. You want life to be harmonious, then get married. If you want life to be harmonious, then you have to do away with evil. The motivations have to be right. So everything is being rectified in the comedies. 
but these uh, fairies transport the audience's focus. Now remember in Act 1 or Act 2, we're now in the forest. This is a place where you cannot reason because you can't see. Reasoning is very much connected with the eye and with light. The forests are dark and rather than the eye, um, we employ the ear. We hear things in the dark, but we can't see things. And with that inability to see comes the ability to imagine and the, our imaginations void of the power of reason to determine what things are and the, and the threat posed by it tend to run towards bad thoughts like you have in the night in the dark when you're scared as a child or maybe older, I don't know. But you, you fear what you hear because you don't know what it is. What was that noise? Could be a mouse, could be a cat, could just be the creaking furnace, or it could be a monster. And, um, but the fairies, what they do is they effectively transport the audience's focus to a more, um, to a perspective above, above that of society, above human nature as they experience it. And they, they allow us to think that things could be otherwise. Now, if you only use reason, in Athens, there's no way out of the dilemma that they're in. Because Theseus says, you have to obey your father's will. And my only, your, my only option for you is, well, you can go to the, uh, you can go live with the nuns. That, that's, a, that's a choice for you. If you want, you can do that. But he can't make love right. He can only undo some of the wrongs. And this is not an ordered civilization. He's, they're not loving the good or the just for the sake of the good or the just, which is what Plato would have commended us to do. And so what the fairies do is they transport the audience's focus to a humanly impossible realm. Uh, in part demonstrated by the fact that they're capable of doing things and seeing things all over the world in an instant. So there is a godlike vantage. And this is the playwright's vantage. It's the utopian, idealistic vantage. Let's imagine things could be perfect. How would we make it so? And then they have the ability, unlike Shakespeare or you or I, to actually see that. Um, instant, instantaneously. Now Puck in Act 2 speaks of the myth of the changeling and this is, introduces a bit of, um, of sin into the realm even of the fairies I would say. The, the whole world is marked by sin. It's not declared as such uh, very often. Occasionally there's references that but it's the clear effect of it in the changeling myth um, which, which is part of English folklore culture, uh, the fairies take babies away from their families and replace them with one of their own. So you, they put a fairy baby in the place of the human baby and then they, they raise the human baby as, as if it were their own baby. And Titania has snatched a baby from its cradle. A baby stealer. So, I mean... We're a little less sympathetic with Titania than we might have been at this point. Why on earth, what motivates her to want a child? And is this not demonic? It certainly doesn't seem particularly uh, something that we would commend. But to add to the problem, Oberon wants the baby. Why? Never declared. It's not clear, but he wants it. And there's, so there's discord even among the fairy figures who represent a sort of a dramaturge figure, but also a godlike reconciling power. But even, with, even amongst the fairies, there is a sense of, of uh, brooding evil or potential evil here. Something that does not consider human concerns first and foremost. They're, they're selfish. Titania took the baby, Oberon wants that baby. Why? because he wants to rule over her, pretty much. It's like we saw with Theseus uh, at the beginning, um, because I said so, 
the, the male figures who have a natural hierarchy over the female in one sense are using it for simple arbitrary because. That's it. Why? Because. With no uh, good end intended outside of the good of affirming their own power. And Shakespeare sees this as seriously problematic. Potentially tragic. So to add to the complexity of this, Oberon, the king of the fairies, is in love with Hippolyta, the Amazon queen who's about to marry Theseus. And Titania is in love with Theseus. Okay, so now we have a further complexity. Not only do we have the human lovers, Hermione, uh, Hermione and Lysander, and, but we also have the fairies involved in, but I love him, and I don't love you, and he loves her, and advice. so everybody is loving somebody they shouldn't be loving. And even the fairies are not exempt from the problem here. And jealousy ensues, and the jealousy that ensues creates disruptions in nature and harm. Say This is not just a, uh, Shakespeare's worldview is not simply presenting things on a human plane, it's suggesting that discord is in the whole cosmos. The whole cosmos has been infected by uh, chaos caused by what we have to uh, attribute to sin. Because there is no, worth, no other cause here. So Oberon and Titania are natural deities, and yet that even nature the realm of nature is marked by sin. When I say marked, I mean marred. Nature is not a good force. So again, we need to speak against the romantics view of nature as nature as being ever good. And if we just do things naturally and listen to nature, then everything will turn out right. If we just create perfect human order, utopia will ensue. That's the progressive view. That's the romantics view. It is not Shakespeare's view. He does not think nature is wholly good because it too has been corrupted by sin and the fall. When Adam falls, the whole of nature falls. Look at Milton's Paradise Lost. He gives the standard Renaissance view of what happens when sin ensues. Nature falls with Adam because Adam was made of the clay. He is the sovereign over uh, the whole created order. He's the regent under God's uh, rule. He's to be exercised dominion over the earth because he comes from the earth. There's a connection between him. But when Adam falls, it's not just humanity that falls, but nature falls with him. And it can't be fixed by appealing to nature and the template of nature because nature itself bears the marks of sin. And that's in terms of apologetics, that's demonstrated through the feature of nature that we call entropy. Things just fall apart. They naturally break down now. They don't remain static. They don't, certainly don't improve. In fact, they get worse and worse. And Shakespeare's view of history would actually accord exactly with this. There were men that lived before us who were better than us. Not worse, not like the cavemen, who uh, had, didn't have the knowledge that we did. That's the progressive view. They posit the idea of cavemen for which there is no empirical evidence, by the way, zero. And there cannot be because the cavemen don't leave writing, right? We have evidence that people were in caves. I've been in a cave. Does that make me a caveman? Right? And of course not. And they, they put pictures on the side of the caves okay and that proves uh, anyway like the, the 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 hypothesis of the caveman is there to demonstrate the progressive ideology and, and nothing else it's a necessary placeholder to suggest that there's a historical there's historical evidence for this because it's all based on science right no it's it's a fanciful hypothesis contradicted by what we see in the ancient world which is that there are great individuals who lived in the past and when we say great we mean virtuous and they lived longer furthermore there's evidence for that in scripture 
Um, and I, I do take those years to be real years then. Um, so there's, if there's anything that we see from the play of human history, we see that there is a degeneration going on in terms of even what we call our physical nature. Our bodies uh, break down and they are now, people are getting worse and worse through, well, now that we have the science of genetics, through copying mistakes. People get sicker. They're not as healthy as the previous generations. They don't live as long. They're not as intelligent. That's hard to accept. I like to think that we're smarter than our parents, etc. It's one of the uh, great uh, appeals of progressivism is that we can think that we're better than our parents. And they were better than their parents. Everyone buys into the lie. We love things that flatter us and suggest that things are going to get better. And if technology also makes the world better, it, it just reinforces that. But Shakespeare's view is that human nature is a thing that is perfectible, but it is perfected in Christ. He is the perfect human being, and we can be restored to that, but we cannot improve upon that. And education is to return us to the garden, hence the importance of the garden metaphors throughout Shakespeare's work. We want to restore to that primal, we can't restore to the innocence, but we can have a second innocence of sorts. Realize the, uh, that the ideal is obeying God and living our lives accordingly and ordering them in accordance with that. Well, Oberon and Titania are natural deities, but they are marked by the fall themselves. So don't think of them as these wonderful angelic beings. There's something dark about them even as well. Now, Oberon uses, just to go to the plot, uses his natural charms to overcome the conflicts that he sees between the lovers. And he employs his servant, Puck, to do his will. Because, of course, the aristocrat doesn't get his hands dirty. He tells one of the servants to do what he wants. But Puck, because he is an or he's a figure of m disorder and misrule, again, he's part of English folklore, regularly screws up the commands. And the conflicts that he's meant to resolve, he makes worse. And then the question for the audience is, is he trying to do this or is he just incapable of doing things right? And it's not clear, actually. There's a little bit of, I mean, is he a demonic character? And I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't think he's a, a figure of malevolence. Um, I do think that because he's chaotic, chaotic leads to bad outcomes. And, and so maybe you might not want to employ Puck. <laughs> Actually, you might want to find somebody else to do your bidding if you want what you've commanded to get done. Don't, don't use Puck. But he does use Puck, and the result of this is uh, in the forest, initially, what threatens in the civilized world could become even worse in the world of nature. Um, because what Oberon wants, and this is the right use of his reason, he wants the, to create a rational love between the characters so that they want to love what is lovable rather than uh, the opposite, and that everybody is in agreement with this. So it, concord will result. But uh, unfortunately, because he employs Puck, discord uh, results and disillusion from the illusion that he employs uh, come to the point where, as I say, death is almost uh, the most likely outcome and suicide. And it's only at that point of extremity that things are rectified and, and brought back into order. And that's partly because he, he uses um, damaged tools like Puck. Um, but what we clearly see in the forest is a place where reason does not function clearly, and so to try and rationally order things is not going to work very well in that place. It's going to have to be back in the context of civilization, society, uh, that things are going to be returned to order. So they're not going to get married in the forest. I know it's a convention these days. People love going into the forests and getting married in the, the beautiful forest. But the forest in Shakespeare's day is the wilderness. It's the wild. It's not a place of goodness. 
It's a place of broken goodness. It's a place where there's no dominion of Adam over nature, and there are all sorts of wild beings. It's not a place inhabitable for mankind. You cannot live in the wild. It's a curse to be sent into the wilderness. And if you don't think so, try moving into the wilderness. And you might think that it's great, but you'd only think it's great because you think society is even worse. There are even greater threats in the city than there are here, but make no mistake, going to the wilderness is not a refuge. Uh, Wordsworth's nature is a nature which, in which all the wolves had been hunted out of existence. There are no bears. It's, you're not going to be eaten by predators. If you try that in Canada, good luck to you. Better have a gun and a lot of bullets. And a lot, you're going to have the means to uh, preserve your own life that are pretty extreme. This is an extreme existence. Um, and the, the, the forest for Shakespeare does not represent a place to retreat to. It's, not a, it's, it's a dangerous place. And the, again, this reflects the whole ancient world's view as well. In fact, um, Western culture's view and Eastern culture's view for that matter. People don't go into the forest, the woods, the wilderness to be closer to God. That's an absurd view. Again, romantics, distilled to the rest of us. It's a place of danger. And, and you, because among other things, there, are, there might be men there, but these are lawless men. What will lawless men do to you? Well, whatever they want, basically. They'll steal from you, they'll rob from you, they'll kill you, who knows what they'll do. But they, what they, they will not be held to the laws. It's a dangerous place. In uh, most of human history, one of the most dangerous things you could ever do is travel. Uh, today we have passports that says that our government's got our back. Right? There is somebody who, yes, this person belongs to this country, the, the, the nation that stands behind the passport will intervene on your, intercede on your behalf, and that solves some of the problems. In the ancient world, they have no such things. Or if they do, does, does the person who sees the, you know, like you've got a, a seal, I've got the seal on this from the prince of so forth. Oh, well, I, what do I care about him? If I have a good relationship with him, okay, well, maybe you can pass. But I'm not worried about invasion if I assault you and deprive you of whatever I want. Uh, now we do. So traveling has become safer as a result of that. Is the world more civilized? Uh, it's reduced some of the harms of travel. Anyway, um, but the forest here is a place where and this shows some of the malevolence of it, the imagination and the passions are heightened. Not a good thing. Remember, Shakespeare's hier hierarchical view of the human person suggests that your reason rules over your passions, but in the forest, the passions are even more strongly felt and represented. And the imagination is the sort of imagination that creates anarchy and destruction and madness. And that's even without the influence of the love charm, which is to be daubed on their eyes so that they fall in love with the first thing they see and so forth. Um, and, and we see in Act 2, Scene 1, that Helena debases herself almost to, to the masochistic point. She is just despises herself, wants to be mistreated. And Demetrius uh, is aggressive towards her, very aggressive to the extreme. He's willing to beat her up. And she it says, do it, right? I deserve that. Yes, <laughs> you know, beat me. And, 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 but, and I'll love you. This is how much I love you. Let me show you how much I love you. And he'll say, I'll show you how much I hate you. And she, right? So there's a, a terrible relationship. Yes, it's, and it's not presented the way we see in Fifty Shades of Grey. This is a wonderful, loving relationship. This is, a, this is sadism. And she's masochistic. It's disordered. Yes. Okay, so that is a good question. 
over on Titania. It might be in the next scene, is it? It must be. No, Demetrius and Helena. Oh, is it in uh, it, it, I think it's in 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, my notes are not altogether accurate here, so where is it? Is it in 2-2? Two, two? Yes, it is. So Puck comes in. Uh, Helena, line 108. Do not say so, Lysander. Say not so. Uh, oh, and actually, it's Demetrius, though, who's the abusive one. So it's not even Act 2, Scene 2. It must be in Act 3. If you find it, let me know. But I only have it in my notes. My notes are clearly not accurate. It is in, it is in uh, Scene 1, isn't it? Okay, Demetrius and Helena, who is following him. Demetrius, I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou, hold, thou toldst me they were stolen unto this wood, and here am I, and wood within this wood, because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, Get thee gone and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant. But yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. So she's like a, it's a magnet, and she's the iron filings falling around, but she's not iron, she's steel. And, and so he's, he's pull, he, she can't help herself. Demetrius. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Or rather, do I not, in plainest truth, tell you I do not, nor I cannot love you? And even for that, do I love you the more? I am your spaniel. Little dog, you know, spaniels are like. I'm your spaniel. And Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am to follow you. What worser place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as you use your dog? Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. Okay, so this is not a great relationship. This is not Fifty Shades of Grey. This is, this is a disordered, abusive relationship, not idealized, to put it mildly. This is a result of sinful, abusive character, and it, it's the result of the forest as well. That enhances the problems of character that are already there, latent within them, or even not latent. So... Um, as I say, Helena debases herself in a masochistic fashion, fashion, and Demetrius is sadistic. He wants nothing to do with her. He's not sadistic in the sense that he actually uh, gets any enjoyment of it. He just despises her, and she loves it. <laughs> Treat me like your spaniel. <laughs> anyway, Act Two, Scene Two: Helena and Lysander and Hermia are, have all fallen asleep. And Lysander, rather chivalrously, it must be said, sleeps some distance from Hermia because he doesn't want any allegations of impropriety to ensue. He regards her highly. He'll sleep at a distance from her. Now, Puck assumes, because he's at a distance, that Lysander has scorned Hermia. And as a result, does Dobbs the wrong person. Dobbs the wrong person with the, with the potion. Um, so Lysander, anointed with a love charm, awakes and becomes infatuated with Helena. Okay, and, and she thinks that Lysander is mocking her. Like this before and after, and now he's even more sadistic. Oh, I love you. And like this is the, like, I can't even bear to look at you, you hideous woman. And now he professes undying love to her, and she just thinks, I know what this is. This is irony. You are really cruel. But so, okay. So Lysander, in his deluded state, believes he's now finally seeing reason by choosing Helena over Hermia. 
And there's irony in this because he's not seeing, he's under the influence of the love potion. Yes, but now she doesn't know what to do with this. And this is part of the comedy again. Like she seemed to like him when he didn't like her, but now that he really likes her, she's like, mm, I don't know about this guy. He's a bit too nice. He's too nice. He's everything I ever wanted. And now that he's like that, ah, who would want to be with this guy? So, so Shakespeare is, is showing that the light enables the senses to reason. Um, and yet in some ways, again, it needs to be, uh, there, there needs to be a rational basis for this. At, at, at present, there is no rational basis whatsoever. Remember that in Shakespeare's view, uh, love works with reason, works with truth. Again, this is a Christian motivation, it, but it's not only Christian. As I say, uh, Plato would hold the same thing. We're moved by love. There's the ordo amoris, as Augustine calls it. Um, and also, it's a highly reasonable thing to love what is ultimately lovable. And what's most lovable is the goodness, the truth, the beauty, etc., and the just. And so we ought to love those things and prize them for their own sake. So Hermia's explanation for Lysander's absence is that Demetrius has slain him. So you can see there's a, like a comedy of errors here now. It's just one thing on top of the next. And the result of that is more and more and more chaos ensues. And as the chaos multiplies, the possibilities of tragedy increase. <clears throat> so there's a buildup of deception and conflict and the threat and violence that ensues. And that allows the parallel between the lover's plot and the Pyramus and Thisbe story of, um, of the commoners to s become plausible. And where the audience is at this point, oh no, we know what's going to happen here. They go to be together because they love each other, but then they think one of them is, sl the other thinks the other is dead and therefore they take their own life. So that, the threat of suicide is prominent in the audience's mind at Act 2, Scene 2. And Oberon and Puck, realize that they've got things wrong and they try to correct their mistake and they give Demetrius the love charm. Uh, and uh, what, one thing I wanted to comment on here, Puck is not like Cupid. Um, he, he is not motivated by love himself. Cupid seems to be an adorable little fat cherub-like creature, and he himself is motivated by love just like Venus who employs him is. There's something in this. He's not a figure of mischief. Puck is not m motivated by, by love himself. He is, uh, but his, his, uh, the effect of Puck's work is the same as Cupid. So there is a similarity in outcome, but not of motivation. There's just, just distinguishing that a little bit there. Um, but note also in Act uh, two, scene two, there is a shorter rhyme scheme at various points. And we move into, tet rather than uh, pentameter, he starts writing in uh, tetrameter. <clears throat> and the, the speeches between, uh, uh, note also, even note things like this. Puck, when he's in the presence of Oberon and Titania, speaks in rhyming couplets and in meter. When he is in different situations, he will lose that order and hierarchy in his speech. He's very much uh, influenced by his uh, context, which is a true reflection of human character as well, by the way. People behave better when in the presence of situations where, they, where people are behaving better and like wise. If you, bad company corrupts good character. It just does. So one of the things they do in schools with kids that are misbehaving is they throw them in the company of the, the kids who are doing really well and they hope that it'll rub off on the bad kid and it never, it doesn't work that way. All it does is mess up the kids who are doing well. They just find that kid really difficult and they can't fix the problem because the 
The problem is that they're peers and there's no natural hierarchy there anyway. If the adults can't fix the child, uh, his peers are certainly not going to do it. It's beyond their ability to do it. Now, the hope is that the child will be influenced by kids that, uh, and want to do it for a different reason because the child's not obeying the natural hierarchy of an adult in authority. And so the hope is that, well, maybe he'll willful, willingly do it for a different reason. Maybe it's just rebelliousness and we can get him to want to do it rather than just to do it for the sake of obedience. And unfortunately, it doesn't work particularly well. Um, but again, we are egalitarians, and we think that egalitarian solutions are going to, problem the pro are going to solve the problems of disordered character, um, even when it's proved to be uh, impossible and unworkable every time. It never works, and yet we keep going back to it. <coughs> so um, they, uh, as I say, the non-human puck is not subject to the passions like Cupid, um, but he works to the effect of Cupid. And when he's in the presence of Oberon and Titania and the fairies, he even talks like them. But when he leaves their company, his own nature seems to take over, which is that he is chaotic and seems to take great delight in that. Furthermore, he, de he delights in disorder. And what we have in the whole of Act 2 being set up is a technique that I'm going to call discrepant awareness. The audience sees what's going on. The characters don't. The characters don't see what we see. So there's an element of us having the perspective of the gods. We're, we're watching the aristocratic characters. We're watching the commoners, uh, the lovers who are just like us for the most part. And yet we are seeing it from the outside and we can see what they can't see. Now what that allows us to do is to reflect on what's going on the stage without being implicated in the action too much. And that allows you a little bit of distance to move yourself, away. You, you reflect, well actually I've acted a bit like Demetrius at one point. Maybe I w might want to stop doing that <coughs> and so forth. It's, there's a discrepant awareness there and this is part of the didactic function of, of theater. It allows us to see things from a distance and learn them uh, vicariously through the actions of others. We, we, they only move us if we, if we sympathize with them. If we despise them, that might be okay, actually. Stay away from those characters, but we're motivated by characters who we want to be like, and those are the good characters. And they may have virtues that we don't. And yet we could have them if we acted more like them, and we're going to see how a good character will act in this situation. So the discrepant awareness builds up. The audience sees what's going on. The characters do not see what we see. <laughs> and the feelings of the characters are even disguised from themselves. They're not aware of their own true feelings. How often is this the case in uh, literature? like in uh, Pride and Prejudice. Elizabeth is not aware that she's falling for Mr. Darcy. The reader is, actually. But she even isn't. She doesn't know. But we, we, are, we can read into it. Now, so there, there's an element of, on our part, of, of delight in having that superior vantage point as well, where we can see something where even the admirable character doesn't see it. And yet we see it and we think, okay, so I, and, and the result of that is that actually it moves us to want to be even better. It's, it's actually a very beneficial thing. Having moral characters that you admire, nonetheless be inferior to you in your ability to judge the situation. Now, it, it doesn't mean that it actually follows in real life <laughs> that you're going to be better than Elizabeth Bennet. But you're going to think that you can and you're going to want to be. Uh, be better. So as I say, they, the, but the, the feelings of the characters, even the characters don't see them. And that, it, that in itself is also realistic. Uh, we don't know why we do what we do. And sometimes we do what we don't want to do. Sometimes we don't do what we ought to do. And Paul talks about that as the effect of sin. <coughs> so now, towards the end of Act 2, Demetrius is infatuated with Helena. 
And we have a very different situation than the one that ensued at the outset there. And Helena's self-doubt becomes uncontrollable. And she cannot believe that both Demetrius and Lysander love her. Although she began the, the whole play with uh, saying, there's no reason why they shouldn't love me. I'm tall and fair. I have all of the natural attributes. I have good this, good that. Why, the, why don't they love me now that they, now they do love her? What's her response to this? She's troubled by it. Now you might say, how on earth can somebody who wanted this so badly now be troubled when she gets what she wants? And the answer is, she's a woman. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. I have no answer, I have no answer. A better answer would be, she's a human being. People get what they want and then they realize, oh no, like, oh, I didn't really want it as much as I thought I wanted it. And why is that? I have no idea. People are really confusing beings. Sorry, that was a voice of a fallen sinful man frustrated <laughs> by interactions with the opposite sex over years. <coughs> and it cuts both ways. The opposite sex, <coughs> this is why comedies work between sexes, by the way. The opposite sex finds the other sex humorous and finds themselves humorous in relation to the opposite sex. There's a lot of realm for comedy. Comedy is always between the, the uh, opposite sex. Gay comedies don't work. They don't work. They work to a, a small degree, but not, not the same. There isn't the same uh, sense of complementarity and yet difference that gives rise to so much misunderstanding so much misunderstanding and you say this and the person says but i don't like the way you said that well how would you want me to say that well you wouldn't if you have to ask then you know, that's so it's like okay right and and you will even find the men come in and say well yes you really put that and if you put it that way there's no undoing that and you better be quiet at this point because you're it's only going to keep getting worse and of course it does keep getting worse that's what you see in comedies very realistic so, but, so at this point, Helena, Helena gets everything that she wants at the beginning of the play, and yet she's most miserable. She doesn't know what to do with it. Too much happiness. Loved by both parties. Okay, so let me move on. Um, let me think here. How, how far are we into this? Shall we take a wee break? I think we sh should. What time is it? Not yet. A little early, isn't it? Okay, so let me, let me carry on. So act three, uh, scene one, we have the commoners come back in. And with the commoners, uh, a little bit of light comic interlude. The whole thing is a comedy, but the commoners are consistently uh, humorous for us. And there's no real tragedy in these characters. They're the most likable actually. They're the most useless, but they're the most likable. And tragedies work when the hero is better than us and we can see and sense the virtue of the character and feel the height of their fall when they are brought down. And we, as the audience, it works because we think if such a figure can uh, fall and come to ruin, then so can we. And so we really sense the, the, the loss and apply it to ourselves. We're, we learn from that. In comedy, the figures are below us. We have to look down on them. Comedies almost always portray people who are dumb and dumber. They always have to use fart humor, body humor, but they usually do. Because again, our bodies thinking hierarchically, they don't obey us either. <laughs> and we think there's humor in that. Here, the, the, the daughters don't obey their fathers. The subjects don't obey their sovereigns. Puck doesn't serve his masters. Things are not working the way we ought to. There's humor in that. We're supposed to be in charge of everything. We're not in charge of anything. We can't even control our bodies. They make noises and smells and whatever <clears throat> that we don't want, and yet we laugh, especially when they start hitting adolescents. Then that all, oh, everything's sexual innuendo and body humor and all that. It's, it's hilarious. <coughs> um, so 
With that in mind, in Act 3, Scene 1, we see the figure of Bottom emerge as the key character. And Bottom is associated with man's lower nature, his carnal nature. He's, his name's Bottom. You sit on him. Titania, who will fall in love with him, is the very opposite. Remember, Titania loves Theseus. But she comes to involve herself here, uh, to, um, and, and, and a union takes place that should never have taken place. She loved the human being that was most uh, aristocratic, Theseus, but she's going to fall in love for the very worst character in the whole of uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream, namely Bottom. Bottom is associated with the worst aspects of it, our passions, our carnal human nature. Titania is the opposite. She's the queen of the fairies. She's ethereal. She's uh, angelic in some ways. And the union of the two attempts to unite discordant opposites. And yet there, it's inappropriate, the union. It's ludicrous, farcical. And what it does is it heightens our sense of the absurdity of this duality in human nature that we have bodies and they don't obey us they don't do what we want um, the discrepancy between the way our bodies let us down through tiredness or weakness or whatever and the way our minds think of things that are beyond uh, human realms is, is the subject of human religion uh, and leads many to the belief that the body is a prison house for the soul. The soul is good and its desires for rational things that we don't see around us. Um, the life of the philosopher is the superior life and the, the life that we ought to pursue. And to do that, we are let down by our bodies. Well, how do we treat our bodies then? And there are various philosophical approaches that ensue from that, from trying to ignore it, to seeing yourself distant from it, to trying to, to mortify the flesh, <coughs> and so on and so on. Um, and so here we have a forced imaginative outcome, which is that Bottom and Titania are united. But that unification is not a, a, a right unification, it's a forced one, in which the worst is married to the best. And what, it, what we note uh, is always true here, and I would say it to this day is true, is that the unification of the worst with the best does not ennoble Bottom. He doesn't become aristocratic. We don't suddenly admire Bottom. It simply degrades Titania. That's all that ensues. So this is a disordered use of the imagination. There is a marriage, but it's a marriage of opposites in which neither side benefits. You do not improve the lot of the animal kingdom by giving them personhood. By tre treating them as if they were not beasts. You do ennoble uh, animals by treating them with the care that comes with being a vice region of God on earth and showing um, that you're a steward of creation. That, that's treating the creature rightly. Marrying your pup is not the good outcome. You don't want to marry the dog or the animal or the, in this case the ass. Titania does not want to marry a donkey. It's a bad outcome. It degrades her. It doesn't make him any more noble, although she praises him. She thinks from her perspective. So it's, it's an argumentum ad absurdum here. This is how not to do it. But Titania, speaking in noble tones, falls prey to lust herself in the end. And this is the irony here. She becomes worse for it, and he becomes no better. So it's a bad outcome. Um, let me read a bit of this. Uh, I'll skip over Bottom and Quince and Snout and these characters. Where does she come in? 
Uh, line 120 thereabouts. Uh, maybe just a bit before that, one line, one, 114. <coughs> oh, bottom, this is Snout speaking. Oh, bottom, thou art changed. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Snout goes out. Note that there's, there, the lines on the page run over. There's no ordering to the lines. These are the commoners. There's no ordering of their reasons. They speak with their passions. They're true to themselves. They're sincere. Sincerity is much prized in the romantic world. Be yourself. Just say what you think. Speak what's on your mind. This is bad advice. Do not just say what you think. No, really, I want you to tell me. You don't, actually. The person who asks you what they, what they mean is, what they mean is that they think that you're going to say something very kind. And so you better say that kind thing or risk the outcome. Now, maybe you should risk the outcome. Jordan Peterson thinks that people should be truthful and honest at all times. And ultimately, down the road, it's going to get, create a good outcome. And I think in, a, in an ideal universe, it would do so. However, in our universe, that's not the universe we live in. If you speak truth to power, you're going to get crushed. And ultimately, the world might be better. Mm, not so sure about that. Not in a sinful fallen world, it won't. You just get crushed. <laughs> so that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pursue the truth, but it should lead you to a little bit more measure in your speech in certain situations. Anyway, uh, but if you believe that human nature is ultimately good, which Jordan Peterson does, then you think that by acting on truth and goodness, the world will ultimately be directed by truth and goodness. Again, he doesn't have a fallen view of human nature uh, at, a, at a deep level. Superficially, yes, through social conventions. But if we use new social conventions, the world will become better and better. Shakespeare doesn't believe this. It's not a Christian view. Anyway, um, bottom thou art changed. What do I see on the, well, what do you see? You see an ass head of your own, do you? Enter Quince. Bless thee, bottom, bless thee. Thou art translated. Bottom, I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me to fright me. Now he looks like he's got the ass's head on him, right? He doesn't know that he has this, and he keeps making references to the ass, and he says that they're asses, and they're trying to make an ass of him, and the audience, with the discrepant awareness, is, uh, is laughing at all of them. To fright me if they could, but I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here, and I will sing that they shall hear I am not afraid. And I'm not going to sing. The woozle cock so black of you with orange tawny bill, the throstle with his note so true, the wren with little quill, Titania awaking. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? Bottom sings, the finch, the sparrow, and the lark, the plain song cuckoo gray, whose note full many a man doth mark and dares not answer nay. Now, he's singing in couplets, and there's some uh, order to what he says, but it's nonsense still. There's no, there's no goodness in what he says. And, and then he carries on, for indeed, who would see his wit to so foolish a bird? Who would give a bird the lie, though he cry, cuckoo, never so? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy fair virtue's force perforth doth move me on the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Okay, so now we're going to get a repetition of we saw, what we saw with Demetrius and Helena. A self-abasing woman, here it's not a woman, it's the queen of the fairies, she is going to just abase herself. She wants to be a spaniel. It's this, <laughs> The woman is spaniel again. Not a good place to go as women. Don't do the spaniel. Not helping you um, in the situation. Uh, and bottom, methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. And yet, to say the truth, reason and love do keep little company together nowadays. 
the more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Nay, I can gleek upon the occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Not so, neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own turn. Out of this wood do not desire to go, says Titania. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state. And I do love thee, therefore go with me. And I'll give thee fairies to attend on thee. And they shall fetch thee jewels from the deep. And sing while thou on pressed flowers dost sleep. And I will purge thy mortal grossness so that thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace blossom, cobweb, moth, and mustard seed. Now the fairies come in and they're there to do her bidding. But what is her uh, offer to him is that he will become a god like her. He'll be immortal, he'll become ethereal. The grossness of his body will be left aside. He'll become more spiritual. Uh, they come in, Titania, be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs, and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for the night tapers crop their waxen thighs, and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes to have my love to bed and to arise, and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Nod to him, elves, and do him courtesies. Hail, mortal, hail, hail, hail. I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name, says Bottom. Cobweb, peace blossom, mustard seed, whatever. So they're going to be his servants now. He's a little aristocrat in the forest, and she is going to make him an ethereal being. She's going to improve him. She's a woman who has a, yeah, you know, there's a little bit of a fix-up job, but I, I, you know, I can take care of this. We're going to make him better. What is that? That's uh, a little bit of a fixer-upper. What's the name of that song? Or the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, she sees him, bottom, he's a little bit of a fixer-upper here. <coughs> and uh, except the difference here is that she doesn't see any faults in him. She just sees that he is a mortal being who can be improved by acquaintance with a divine being such as herself and will become more like her. Unfortunately, that does not happen and we see her degenerate and he, him just become ridiculous as, a, as a, an ass enjoys being, getting a lot of food, he's gonna be very happy, but he's not gonna become better in any, uh, any true sense. So in act three, scene two, let me skip to this and then we'll, we'll have a brief break. Uh, in act three, scene two, line 177, Hermia reveals to us what is happening in the forest. In a, I think it's a prophetic statement, but she doesn't seem to quite understand the truth of what she's saying here. She says this, Dark night, that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes. Wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not, thou art not by mine eye, Lysander followed, Found, rather, mine ear, I thank it, brought me to thy sound. But why, unkindly, didst thou leave me so? So, um, um, we can see that the eye representing reason has been suspended here, the ear representing the imagination rules over and hearing with the imagination. Um, uh, presents a state where they're all uh, beyond reason. It's a, this is a, the, the, the forest is a place where reason does not rule. Human beings are rightly ruled by their reason, so they cannot live in the forest. They cannot have their ills rectified in the presence of a, an uncivilized place. 
It might be a retreat to get away from the city for a bit, but it's nowhere where you can live. You cannot live there. You'll have to transform the so forest. You'd have to cut the trees down and cultivate the earth and domesticate animals, etc. cetera. Um, that you could do, but that would be a lot of hard work. <clears throat> At any rate, um, <clears throat> there is discord that's happened. And again, we've just seen that Titania is, has fallen in love with Puck and Oberon thinks this is quite funny. Again, Oberon is not altogether a, an admirable being. There are no admirable beings in this play. Even the, even the king and queen of the fairies uh, are uh, disordered in certain ways. Now, the effect of the comedy will be to rectify every ill in every uh, figure. But uh, what Shakespeare is demonstrating here is uh, his view that man has a double nature. It, part of him is an animal, part of him uh, is divine in his thoughts, in his apprehensions. Hamlet will give this grand speech on that. We'll see a little bit uh, later in the course. Uh, the, there's this dual nature. On the one hand, he does the worst things that no animal would ever do. He's a sort of animal, the worst, most perverse of all animals. And, and, and he is a wolf to his fellow man. On the other hand, he is capable of acts that no beast could ever contemplate. That can only be likened to the divine. So there's this duality to human nature uh, in this. Uh, where was I? There. Um, Lysander, in response to Hermia's speech, why should he stay whom, thou, whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love. Uh, note this is Hermia now, who's gone into the forest hoping for better, and now she has nobody. Lysander's love could press me from your side, Hermia, that would not let him bide. Fair Helena, who more engilds the night than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light. Why seekst thou me? Couldst not this make thee know? The hate I bear thee made me leave thee so. Okay, so now Lysander hates Hermia. There's a lot of, so in, in the dark forest where no civilization is to be found, uh, the men become brutal, savage, nasty. Uh, eventually Thomas Hobbes is gonna say that's the state of human nature. That's not Shakespeare's view, that's Thomas Hobbes' view. It's a certain understanding of human nature that uh, left unto its own devices, that is the state of nature. Shakespeare doesn't agree. He says that's part of it, you make it the whole thing. Right, and therefore Hobbes says that we need to bring in government to prevent the nasty, brutish, short life that will ensue if humanity is given to its devices. Um, Shakespeare, as I say, has a, a rather different view than, than this. Uh, but as I say, we can see that Lysander is now uh, as hostile towards uh, Hermia as we saw Helena received earlier on. So let me, um, I'll, I'll pick up the speech here. So Hermia there and uh, Helena speaks now. Uh, Hermia in response to this, by the way, you speak not as you think, it cannot be. And Helena with Hermia, who's also been spoken to so harshly, now we have a sisterhood. The two of them are saying, and she says this, lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive, actually I'm wrong. Helena thinks that even she's playing her for a fool. That, that's what's going on. Everybody is conspiring against me here. She is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid. Have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? In all the counsel that we, ha we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent, when we have chid the hasty-footed time from parting us. Oh, is all forgot, all school days friendship, childhood innocence, we 
Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower. They're doing needlework. Both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion. You know what a sampler is, right? The round thing that you do. Uh, on one, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate. So we grew together, like to a double cherry, seeming parted, yet, and, but yet in union in partition. Two lovely berries molded on one stem, so with two seeming bodies, but one heart. Two of the first light coats in heraldry, due but to one, and crowned with one crest. And will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend, it is not friendly, it is not maidenly. Our sex, as well as, as, well as I, may chide you for it, though I alone do not do feel the injury. Hermia, I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Okay, so now even the friends are it. So they go in to rectify a love uh, problem of romantic love, and now even friendship is being broken apart. So all the loves are disintegrating in the forest. And then Helena, have you not set Lysander, as in scorn, to follow me and praise my eyes and face? and made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spurn me with his foot, in other words, he gave her a kick, uh, to call me goddess, nymph, divine and rare, precious, celestial, wherefore speaks he this? To her he hates, and wherefore doth Lysander deny your love, so rich within his soul, and tender me, forsooth, affection, but by your setting on, by your consent, what though I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most to love unloved, this you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. Okay, so the two friends, friendship is dissolved here. And as I say, the, the force, the result of the force is greater disintegration, not reconciliation. The imagination is supposed to reconcile discordant opposites in a, in a union, a, a concord, which they couldn't meet in society. The force is not going to solve their problems for them. It is actually leading to even more potentially calamitous outcomes. I think I am going to leave it off there for a minute and 